The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Can technology save the planet and us from the ravages of climate change? Tonight, we'll get three views on that. Then, climate scientist and author Catherine Hayhoe offers some advice on how to reach out to those still doubtful about the problem in the first place. It's Wednesday, October 6th, and that's tonight on The Agenda. Everyone has heard that there is an urgent need for action to confront the climate crisis, but solutions? Well, they're harder to come by. Can technology ride to the rescue? Let's find out from some people working at the forefront of those efforts, and we'll introduce them, as is our custom, from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in Los Angeles, California, with Marcus Extivore. He's Vice President, Energy and Climate at XPRIZE a global nonprofit that spurs innovation through competition for some very lucrative prizes. In Cambridge, Massachusetts, David Keith, hey. professor of applied physics in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences and a professor of public policy in the Harvard Kennedy School. He also co-hosts the podcast Energy Versus Climate. And in Buffalo, New York, Holly Buck, Holly. professor in the University of Buffalo's Department of Environment and Sustainability and the author of After Geoengineering. Climate, Tragedy, Repair, and Restoration. And it's great to have you three on TVO tonight for this very important and timely conversation. David, I want, if we can, just to spend a few moments with you off the top because you had published this past week a, um, a piece in the New York Times about the necessity to accept controversial technologies in order to get a handle on the impacts of global warming. And here is an excerpt from your piece we'll start with and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would, let's bring this up. To cool the planet in this century, humans must either remove carbon from the air or use solar geoengineering, a temporary measure that may reduce peak temperatures, extreme storms, and other climatic changes. This is what it comes down to, carbon removal or solar geoengineering or both. At least one of them is required to cool the planet this century. There are no other options. Okay, let's start there, David. Give us a, give us a brief account of the kinds of technologies you're talking about. Yeah, but first of all, I need to push back. I did not say they were necessary, and I don't believe it. It might not be the right choice to cool the planet. The central issue is political force to drive out the existing fossil fuel infrastructure and to drive emissions down. That is the number one job. And a reasonable public policy would be to do nothing more than that in local adaptation. I think it's worth taking seriously the idea that we might want to actually make the planet cooler because eliminating emissions doesn't make the planet cooler, it just stops it getting warmer. But I uh, don't think it's my place uh, to say that it's necessary and I don't believe it's necessary. But do you think we should have the debate? I think we should know more about what the benefits and costs are of these things so that people can have more informed discussions about the public policy. And I wrote that piece because I'm concerned that there's a level of overhype around carbon removal, uh, uh, overhype that I think in different ways my, both the other guests are involved in. And I think it's really important to be clear-eyed about the way it's being exploited by those in power to uh, distract from emissions cuts. Well, all right. For, well, for those watching right now who, right. when you say to them geoengineering, start scratching their head because they don't quite know what that means, can you give us a sense of what you're talking about? So it's a contested term, but for me, solar geoengineering means different ways that humans might deliberately intervene or alter uh, the Earth's energy balance, the way the climate works, uh, with the goal of reducing some of the climate harms that come from the accumulated uh, carbon in the atmosphere. And why, in your judgment, uh, are they so controversial as, a, as an idea at the moment? I think the central, there are many reasons, but I think the underlying controversy is fear of, of mitigation inhibition or moral hazard, which is really fear that these technologies will be used as an excuse to avoid emissions cuts. All right. Having put all this background in place now, let me go to Holly and put to her a quote that Al Gore said seven years ago. 
stating his opposition to geoengineering and calling it, quote, insane, utterly mad, and delusional in the extreme. That's Al Gore, the former vice president. Does he speak for many when he says that? I think so. I mean, the, the fact that we're in a situation where we know we're warming the planet and we're causing massive extinction. <laughs> you know, it's an insane situation we're in. So I think it's also a fair assessment. I think kind of all, everything that's going on is insane, right? So. Um, all right, but having said that, from, from a geoengineering point of view, do you think that's an option we ought to be considering right now? I think we need more information. So I agree with David and others that we won't know about the potentials and the impacts and the har you know the harms and the benefits unless we do the research. Is the research being done? So this is where solar geoengineering and carbon removal are different. There's some limited amount of solar geoengineering research being done, but it's very early, um, very early stage research. We need a lot more if we want to understand what's going on with this. Carbon removal has received more attention. Um, but right now, so, like David alluded to, some of the, the hype and, and the excitement is getting ahead of the science. Understood. All right. Marcus, is it possible that there is so much skepticism around this? Because so many people in the scientific world think, you know, technology got us into this pickle in the first place, and therefore we're really not sold on the notion that technology is going to get us out of it. Interesting question. I think it's possible some of the skepticism comes from that place. But I think there's another place too, which is uh, we sort of at some point have to admit to ourselves, as Holly was alluding to, that the situation actually is quite dire. You could say that continuing to, with business as usual, avoiding emissions cuts, uh, watching the damage that's unfolding and will continue to unfold, that is also pretty insane. And so when you sit down to map out what if you sit down with a whiteboard and mapped out what the possible options would be, I think carbon removal, solar geoengineering, other things would certainly be on the table. But the question is, do we actually need to go there? Do we want to go there? How much more information do we need? But back to your question, yes, I think there's a lot of resistance to technology. I think it's right to say that our industrial economy is what got us into this place. I personally don't agree with the idea that we can unwind all of our modern economy to go back um, to a past that perhaps, you know, uh, never quite existed. We have to find a way forward. That's sort of our only choice. So it's a question of what is our path forward going to be? Um, and how sold are you on the notion that solar geoengineering can help get us where we need to go? It's a totally crazy idea, but that doesn't mean we may not need it. And we're only going to figure out whether we need it and how to deploy it if that eventuality comes to pass by learning a little bit more. So I'll say that I do support the position of trying to get more information about how these techniques could work and be deployed. That doesn't mean that they're priorities, just like carbon removal. It's the kind of thing that we are increasingly forced into having to consider. That doesn't mean it's our first choice, but talking about alternative choices doesn't mean uh, that they're necessarily job number one, and it doesn't take the focus off of emissions cuts as soon as possible. David, how do you like that description of, it's a crazy idea, but we may actually need it in the end? I don't love it uh, for two reasons. One is I don't really know what it means to say it's a crazy idea. It's kind of an easy thing that people say, but it's not clear to me what it actually means when I try and think about what we know about environmental risks and political risks. It has environmental risks and political risks we can talk about. And I also don't kind of like the framing of need, like we have to do it or we don't, which is coupled with this idea that there's some fixed threshold where we admit enough uh, to keep under, say, 1.5 degrees C and we're safe and uh, over that we're cooked. I, I maybe I, I see this in much more kind of boring professor-ish public policy terms, that it's a, a decision to do this would be a trade-off between the benefits of doing it in terms of reduced harms to ecosystems and people and the technical and physical risks of doing it, such as increased air pollution that would kill people or reduced ozone layer and the political dynamics and instability would create. And, and I think the decisions between whether or not we do solar geoengineering and how quickly we cut emissions are, in fact, less tightly coupled than people often assume. Well, let's, if we can, pluck an example out of your life, because I think, if I've got the details on this right, you were involved in a project on this issue in Sweden, and the project got canceled 
because, as the New York Times reported, uh, there were those who objected to, quote, the normalization of technology that is too dangerous. Can you fill in some of the gaps on that story? Well, I think that's a fair statement. Uh, um, uh, the Sami Council, uh, it's an indigenous group in, in northern Sweden, uh, has a pretty clear statement that says that they don't believe the technologies ever make sense, and so they don't believe research on them makes sense. And they uh, push the Swedish government and the Swedish government to push to cancel the project. So that's that's fair. Um, I think that um, I obviously don't agree, and I also think it's worth thinking hard about uh, uh, what authority any one group has to say that there shouldn't be more knowledge on something, particularly when the evidence evidence is pretty widely agreed in the scientific community and in the IPCC report and so on, are that these technologies could substantially help people, and particularly actually people in some of the poorer countries and hotter countries. And there's also evidence that people in poorer and hotter countries are somewhat more positive on searching these technologies. That evidence might be wrong. But I think given that, I am uh, think legitimately can have any opinion they want. It's a perfectly reasonable opinion, but I don't think that opinion uh, should carry the day in, in public policy. And just one more quick follow-up. Who, in your judgment, is leading the charge against yes. having more knowledge yes. and doing more research? Hmm. I think probably the most effective group is actually originally a Canadian group called ETC. It's now headquartered outside Canada. I think for a long time they're a pretty small group, but they've been really smart and effective at taking uh, 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 the that I and I. What do you what do you suspect their motives are? You can go ask them. I really don't know. Um, I think I think uh, well since 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 you've asked me, I think there's sort of some deep disconnect. So they'll say that they want the world to kind of go back to an earlier technological era and. I uh, sat around with the leader of, of, of that group, Canadian, over a beer one time and pointed out that if we really did go back to kind of peasant-led agriculture, which is what they were suggesting one time, that we couldn't support the current population. A lot of billions of people would end up dying. And his reaction was more or less that that's what's going to happen anyway, so it's okay. And it's not a world that I believe in. I don't think it's an ethical view of the world, personally. I, I think that every life counts equally. And um, we really need to take seriously the fact that real humans are going to get uh, harmed. And political ideology about some imagined perfect world should not be used in ways that will harm people. Hmm. Uh, Holly, David wrote in his piece, quote, the science so far suggests that the harms that would result by shaving a degree off global temperatures would be small compared with the benefits. Let me ask you about trade-offs. Do you think trade-offs to, to get to the finish line here are inevitable? Yes. yes. And how do you see that working itself out? I mean, right now, the status quo is that we don't have a process for democratically deliberating on what those trade-offs are. And this goes for decarbonization broadly, too. I mean, thinking about, you know, when to close natural gas plants. Do we want... Um, full electrification? Do we want green hydrogen? I mean, there's a bunch of options that require discussion of trade-offs. So it's not just solar geoengineering or carbon removal. Um, so I think one thing that could help is if governments really took the lead on public engagement processes that could, where citizens could deliberate about these trade-offs. But if we go back to the story David just told, it sounds like there are certain types of climate activists for whom trade-offs are just not an option. And if that's the case, what do you do with that? I mean, I think then then it's important to have more voices in the room because right now there's, you know, some climate activists that are well informed about these approaches. You know, there's a couple of other scientists, but then there's this vast empty chamber where the public should be. And most of the public has not even heard about these approaches. So, um, maybe not well equipped, but we need to invite them in, have everybody discussing, is particularly in the global south, particularly with frontline communities. Okay, Marcus, let me ask you about Elon Musk. What is his connection to your organization? Well, I think he's been a longtime supporter of the organization, X Prize, but specifically, Musk Foundation is a benefactor behind a prize we recently launched called X Prize Carbon Removal. And how much money has he put into your endeavor? So it's a $100 million prize, and that came from the Musk Foundation. And the goal of the prize is to really try to 
start to separate fact from fiction in some of the claims made around carbon removal and encourage demonstrations of practical, tangible carbon removal demonstrations, even at modest scales. Now, 100 million bucks, I think, even for Elon Musk is real money. So what does he see in the work that you are doing that he thought was so valuable to back? It is a huge amount of money. I mean, it's one of the largest prizes we think, uh, certainly that this organization has launched personally. But I think that uh, from his public statements and you know conversations I've had, he sees carbon removal as one of several options that we may need to rely on more or less, depending on how, um, d how well it actually can be shown to be effective and depending on other choices that we make. So I think it's fair to say that he sees it as one of several options, but something worth at least pursuing further. Now, 100 million bucks is pretty good incentive to come up with some neat ideas. Are you, in fact, getting some interesting ideas on how to do all that? We are. I mean, we just actually closed a student-oriented portion of the prize, which really was just a call for proposals, not demonstrations. We've got a couple hundred of those in the door, haven't actually even had a chance to look through them uh, before our conversation today. But more than wild new ideas, I think what the prize is going to do is try to put ideas into practice. Carbon removal has been discussed in the academic literature for some time. Um, my fellow panelists here in the conversation are well, well familiar with this. What we're really hoping to do is encourage some of these techniques to actually get into small deployment so that we can collect more data, learn more about which ones actually have a future, uh, which ones maybe don't have a future, and how the best can be optimized and taken forward. And when will you decide on a winner? Our timeline's about three and a half years uh, left, so we will be announcing milestone winners uh, based on performance as we go, but the grand prize will be announced approximately Earth Day 2025. And are you the decider? I'm not the decider. I'm more of like the convener, uh, but we have a panel of independent judges, people who work in the field, people who actually maybe don't work in the field, but who know how to look at a, a data set, look at a proposal, and understand uh, whether the team has met the requirements. So the judges are independent, professional volunteers. Gotcha. I'm, I'd like David and, and then Holly to weigh in on what you believe to be the um, appropriateness or the advisability of billionaires trying to shape climate policy. David, what do you say? <laughs> uh, I think billionaires should have less of a voice, uh, less money and less of a voice in shaping policy. And I have real concerns about the X Prize's actions and organization on this topic. There was an earlier X Prize for carbon removal that was uh, sponsored with COSIA, which is an organization basically designed to protect the oil stands and kind of do some innovation while staving off regulation. And um, the structure of that prize was definitely, in my view, uh, designed to help the industry in a way that didn't seem to have a very clear environmental metrics. And uh, I, I really have deep concerns. And the prize for things, some kind of sharp capitalist competition for a well-defined product would actually be successful with things that have a, a big ecosystem uncertainties, where I personally think the money would be much better spent by uh, really sharply directed um, public research efforts, not little startups, that uh, could, uh, in a clear and transparent way, uh, look at environmental impacts of some of these technologies and compare them. So I, I have real concerns. And, and enterprises in these uh, areas uh, actually doing useful things is pretty weak. And um, I, so I, yeah, I'm, I, I have concerns both about the power of billionaires and about the structure of these prizes. Holly, how about you? Holly, how yeah, I think we should be taxing the billionaires and using those funds for research and development. Yeah. And not well giving said. out prizes? I mean, I think maybe that's useful from a public relations point of view to get more attention to it, but it's not going to solve the, the, the challenges much bigger than, than a prize can address. I think the, 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 the challenge here is it's very hard to structure a prize that's effective on what you want to produce is a commercial technology in the real world. So I think it's different. For the original X Prize was a brilliant, simple prize about two flights to, 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 uh, into space which was uh, you know, a very measurable thing and a well-designed. And there have been some prizes for drugs, especially drugs for the underserved poor, that I think were well-designed. But the challenge, and we saw this one earlier version of this prize called the Virgin X Prize, uh, called the, the Virgin VEC Prize. The challenge with developing a prize like this is that you don't really know what technologies, how technologies perform until you, you, you actually do them at commercial scale. And that's something that doesn't happen. $100 million actually isn't very much money in terms of commercial scale for these things. And, and it's really unclear whether the prize judging system is 
actually effective at, at getting the technologies that, that matter here. I think there are better ways to do it. So I'm, I'm really pretty skeptical. Marcus, obviously I should give you an opportunity to tackle those criticisms if you want to. Uh, thanks, I appreciate it. I think with X price carbon removal, um, the guidelines are public, the rules are public, anyone can download and read them. Um, with respect to the judging system the, and the purpose of the prize, the purpose of the prize is not to solve climate. The purpose of the prize is not to uh, generate a solution that can be deployed in 2025. The purpose of the prize is to try to distinguish between ideas that have been discussed in the literature but not really demonstrated at scale and encourage those to try to scale even at a modest scale. It's true what David says that it's not going to result in a commercial deployment in three years. That's pretty unlikely. But what we can do is actually push some of these ideas into demonstration so that we can, the world can evaluate, but in particular the judges can evaluate um, whether they work or not. And with respect to evaluation, it is actually very difficult to design a good prize. I totally agree with that. What we've tried to do here is structure it around the things that matter. Can a carbon removal approach deliver a carbon negative solution? Does it actually remove CO2 from the air or oceans? And does it have a pathway to scaling to a climate relevant level, let's say the gigaton per year level? Um, I'm not going to say that prizes are a panacea or that prizes are the only solution. And I, I wouldn't say that, and it'd be foolish to claim such. But I think it is fair to say a prize can have an important stimulating effect in an innovation ecosystem. It can bring a lot of players together. It can help to focus some capital, but really, I think, acts as an amplifier of existing let's say, academic research, other granting agencies, other policy work. So I see that's uh, that's one way I think prizes can work. And I'll just respond briefly to the uh, the critique of the NRG COSIA Carbon X Prize. Dave and I have spoken about this privately too. We don't have to speak about that prize in hypothetical. We can look at the results. It was awarded this spring. The two winners are from cement and concrete industry, which is probably, again, not a climate panacea, but probably one of the leading and most productive and climate relevant uses of CO2 if we're going to get there. So I'm pretty satisfied with the results, but of course time will tell how impactful those solutions can be in the coming decades. David, you want to come back on that? Yeah, I do. I sat around a top office in Environment Canada a year and a half ago where people were very excited about those little companies. And I think it was very clear that it was standing in the way of the practical ways you would actually cut CO2 emissions from cement. And I think this is a case where it's allowing government officials and the public to get kind of distracted by little shiny startups that look like they're going to do something when you avoid doing what you know you could do. So just 10 kilometers from my home in Canmore, there's a big cement plant that vents more than a ton, more than a million tons a year. We know how to capture from that. We know where to put it. There's no new technology needed, not some shiny object you need. You don't need a startup. Uh, uh, Mitsubishi heavy industries or lots of uh, different companies could bid on that. What's missing is government will. And my view is very up close and personal, seeing this in the Canadian government, my view is that this uh, uh, kind of promise of carbon cure, which I think is very unlikely to be scalable and more expensive than that, is allowing some kind of shiny new thing to distract from actually doing the thing we know that would in a much more cost effective way cut the net CO2 emissions from uh, uh, concrete. So I really think it's been quite disruptive. Marcus, what in your view prevents uh, these kinds of carbon removal technologies from being uh, perhaps uh, more widespread or more readily adopted? They're expensive, lack of political will, and frankly, lack of market incentive. The only way to make these technologies more effective or cheaper is to actually try to develop them. That's what I think a company like Carbon Cure is doing. Um, but, you know, I I'm sensitive to the argument David is making, which is that alternatives to the number one option can be distracting. This is exactly what we're discussing today. We're discussing whether geoengineering or carbon removal are distractions from immediate emissions cuts. I think clearly the risk is there. David says he has upfront personal experience with it. I don't doubt that. I've been in some similar conversations as well. It's clearly and obviously a distraction because there's a strong inertia in our system to maintain the status quo. But talking about alternative solutions we have to find a way to talk about alternative solutions and even explore them without allowing that to be a distraction for steep emissions cuts. So, I mean, to Environment Canada, I would say, shame on you for being distracted if that's the case. This is an alternative, but it's clearly not the first option. The first option is immediate emissions cuts. Let me get Holly to weigh in on this issue of uh, the advisability of prizes. You know, one of the things we've seen 
I mean, you can demonstrate the fact that if you give a lot of money away to uh, authors, let's say, uh, they're going to sell more books. Uh, we have a prize in um, Ontario for poetry called the Griffin Prize, and they give a lot of money away to the best poetry, and the result at the end of the day is a lot more people read poetry than might otherwise read poetry. If, if you take that same principle and you apply it here, is it possible you'll get more interest and focus on climate change because of this prize than you might otherwise have done? Sure, but I think what people need to understand is that the challenge here isn't just getting the best technology. We're building social technical systems. So you have to think about carbon removal like the electricity grid or like the water system. There's a lot of pieces. It's not just about the tech, it's about the institutions, it's about the regulation, it's about the users of that system. It's about, you know, do communities have benefits from it? So maybe a prize can help with some pieces of that, but we don't want the prize to distract from all the other pieces of it too. All right, let me put a new issue on the table here, and that is, and we haven't talked about this yet, and it is, for some, a very non-controversial option, and for others, it is a complete non-starter. David, start us off on a discussion about nuclear energy. Do we need more of it to help us get through the climate crisis? I would like to see more nuclear power because it has a low land footprint. And so you, if you're going to, I think one challenge of decarbonization is that there's no question we can decarbonize without nuclear power. The absolutely stunning improvements in the cost of solar mean that the pathway to large scale decarbonization with solar looks much more real than it did 10 years ago. And, and my view is there's no necessity for nuclear. But there are lots of other technologies like hydro and wind, which have compared and biomass, which have comparatively big land and environmental footprints. And I do think, especially in a cold place with big winters like Canada, uh, if you want to think about ways that solve the climate problem, that is stop putting CO2 in the air, and also reduce other environmental harms, I think it's important to take nuclear seriously. But that said, if you ask me how to do it, how practically, like which reactor technology and what government policy and what way to communicate with the public could get to something that exactly, as Holly said, is a socio-technical system that makes nuclear work, I have no idea. Every element of that is broken. Public trust is broken. The, the companies that develop these technologies have done in some ways a terrible job. I also have just horrific experiences from being on a top panel in Canada and talking to people at um, uh, the Canadian Nuclear Agency and literally, uh, no exaggeration, being lied to. Uh, so, so my faith as somebody who's a physicist and pro-nuclear in, in AACL just went to zero in that experience. So, so we've got broken trust, high costs and problems. Yet I still think there actually is some real use for, for developing nuclear power in a climate future, and it's a big challenge to figure out how to do it. AECL being Atomic Energy of Canada, the once upon a time Crown Corporation. Uh, okay, Holly, you are literally a, a hop and a skip and a jump away from the Ontario border, and we depend on nuclear for about half of our energy mix, maybe some days more than half of our electricity mix here in the province of Ontario. I'm not sure what it is in New York State where you are, uh, but is it an option, do you think, to help get us out of the climate crisis? Yes, I do. I don't think it's perfect. I think we're out of perfect options. And I'm very concerned about, as a sociologist, about social backlash to higher prices or lack of reliable energy. We've seen some fluctuations lately, um, you know, with blackouts, with um, gas shortages in other parts of the world solution to that and if we don't fix that soon i think all of our decarbonization goals could be threatened marcus what's your take on nuclear you know somewhat similar um the, the scientist in me sees that it's a low footprint low carbon electricity source and if you if our goal is looking at climate or specifically looking at greenhouse gas load we it's something we have to take seriously um but I grew up in Ontario. I live in now California, where there's discussion of closing nuclear facilities. Right. I'm always struck at how much dissonance there is between sort of the science of view of things and what the general person that I'll ask, hey, what do you think about nuclear power is? Um, a lot of people just think it's a disastrous idea. They think it's a symbol of the worst excesses of our um, industrial age. I don't quite see it that way. I think it can have a future, but I sort of agree that we don't have a lot of public space to actually have that conversation. And it's possible 
um, we may not be able to navigate through that. So it's hard to say, but I, I think it can have a future, but it'll be pretty tricky. Gotcha. Uh, a few minutes to go here. Let me see if I can get a couple of more items on the table. David, to you first. You recently tweeted, quote, if I were climate czar, a job I would fail at, you add, I would spend more than 95% of current climate effort and money on cutting emissions or adaptation resiliency. What does that actually mean in terms of the technologies uh, you are eyeing at the moment? So I think the big thing, so I, I very much share Holly's view that I'm scared that, that we'll have an overreach and a public backlash against the cost of cutting emissions. So maybe just a few big picture things. You start this with sort of technology versus something else. I think the answer is any solution to this is always about technology and public policy. There's no version of it that doesn't. And people often talk about technology, get that all the methods are involve technology, solar, it's all technology. So I think the, the, the issue is really how cost effectively we drive down emissions. And I'm worried that we're now spending a lot of money on a lot of very high priced things that look kind of sweet, but don't cut emissions very effectively, like say public transit. And then what we'll see is after five years or something, a very high public concern and high government ambition about emissions cuts, we will see energy prices up and emissions not going down very fast. And so my view is we need to be more kind of cold-blooded about actually choosing the big things that can really cut emissions significantly and don't cost that much. It's the, the Willie Sutton rule of like, why, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. You need to focus on the big carbon sources and the big things we can do. That's my earlier comment about the concrete plant near my house, that plant. Those are the kind of uh, uh, opportunities, and I think so are some long-distance transmission lines with solar that really are cost-effective ways to cut emissions. All right. Holly, my follow-up for you. Oops. Sorry, forgive me, David. My follow-up for Holly is some people hope for a restoration of a world without carbon dioxide. Some people would be happy just with a world that is somewhat repaired. Where are you on that continuum? I mean, I, I want to set up my daughter and her generation so that their children have the options to decide what that looks like. Because you know, restoration of the climate isn't something we're going to see in, in my lifetime or yours. You're confident about that? I mean, it, it's going to take a while to build up an infrastructure that would remove carbon at scale. And it will take many, many decades to, you know, draw down greenhouse gas concentrations. So what can we do to equip, you know, the future to take on a project like that if they want to? That's what I'm wondering about. I'm a little distraught. Well, put it this way. Um not in my lifetime, I get, but I'm a lot older than you. And when you say not even in your lifetime, that gets me a little concerned. Really? Not even in your lifetime? I mean, we could cut emissions to zero, but that won't restore the climate. Those are two different things, as David Zopfed discusses. But, but Holly, if I can jump in, it might be possible to begin restoring. So I completely agree with you if the issue is restoring it all the way. But what would you say if the issue was, could we begin to get it cooler? Could we begin the process of heading back towards green industrial your lifetime? What do you think? I think we can begin that process, and that begins with doing the research. Okay, Marcus, I'm going to give you the last word. Is there, I mean, if you go to your website, the future looks pretty awesome. But I want to know how realistic it is. Is there really a future you see that is not all doom and gloom? I certainly think this is a solvable problem if we're talking about climate or even ecological restoration, but I think we shouldn't kid ourselves about how difficult it's going to be. Um, maybe I'm somewhere between Holly and David. I think that I could, I'd could. i like to see emissions, GHG emissions, let's say, peak within my lifetime. I think that's achievable. But I think if you look at the current trajectory, something I say often is, listen, we like to debate about what our favorite climate intervention is. Everyone think of whatever your favorite solution is. In fact, let's take all the solutions you've ever heard discussed. The net effect of all that action is that greenhouse gases continue to go up every year. So that shows us that we have solutions in front of us. We have trade-offs to make, but we do have a long way to go. Hmm. Marcus Extivor, Holly Buck, David Keith, it's really good of all three of you to join us on TVO tonight and share your views. Good luck in your <laughs> big time good luck. Uh, in your work to get us to where we need to go. And thank you for having the discussion with us this evening. Thank you.
solving the climate crisis is a very big ask. But according to Catherine Hayhoe's new book, the small act of talking to each other about it will yield critically important results. She explains how in Saving Us, a climate scientist case for hope and healing in a divided world, Catherine Hayhoe is chief scientist for the global environmental organization, The Nature Conservancy. She is also professor in public policy and public law at Texas Tech University. And she joins us now from Lubbock, Texas. But of course, she's originally from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And Catherine, it's so great to have you back on TVO. How are you doing? Great. Thank you for having me again, Steve. Not at all. We, we often like to reminisce here. And so that's how we're going to start because we're going to reminisce all the way back to almost six years ago during your last appearance on this program. And we talked about whether Republicans in the United States could be made to be interested in climate change. And here's how that conversation went. Sheldon, if you would. But you do think at the end of the day, once the Republicans get a candidate, that candidate will take climate change more seriously? Do you believe that? They will, they will be asked serious questions about it, let's put it that way. And they are not stupid. These people are very smart and they know that two thirds of registered Republicans agree that climate change is real and we should do something about it. So I think we're gonna see people coming back to the center once there's a candidate. Well, it didn't quite work out that way, but your hopes for a less polarized debate in 2016 may not have happened. But where do you think we are today on that front? We are in a different place today, thank goodness, because 70% of people in the US are worried about climate change. And what talking about climate change from the perspective of shared values does work. I was part of a Yale University study that was just done a couple of months ago where they did four short videos, one by a two-term Republican congressman talking about free market climate solutions, one by a retired Air Force general, one by a libertarian talking about personal liberties and how they're affected by climate change. And then I did one too, as a scientist and a person of faith. They aired them in a couple of different districts in the United States, and they found that just exposure on social media to information on climate impacts and solutions that directly connected with people's pre-existing values, it significantly changed Republican opinions. Hmm. So you are encouraged by that? I absolutely am. It shows that it works. And the only question is, why are we not doing it? Well, let me, uh, you know, climate change seemed to be the big issue about which people in an almost tribal sense disagreed when we were last uh, talking on this program. But I, I suspect that has been uh, supplanted now by the issue of vaccinations, vaccine passports, vaccine certificates. And you make the comparison between the two in your book. Do you want to just flush out that argument for us? Absolutely. So people don't wake up in the morning and decide to reject 200 years of physics, including the physics that was just awarded the Nobel Prize for climate modeling. And in the same way, people don't wake up in the morning and just spontaneously decide not to get a vaccine or not to wear a mask. What happens is we wake up in the morning and we go to our social media feeds and we look at what people who we know who we agree with are saying. We go to the media and we look at what pundits and politicians and thought leaders who we agree with about other issues are saying. And climate change and COVID solutions have both become the most polarized issues in the United States and sadly creeping across the border into Canada as well, where the Conservative Party had a vote earlier this year on whether climate change was real and serious and they couldn't even agree in Canada on that. Well, um, let me ask you to do some comparing and contrasting, because of course you're deep in the heart of Texas, but all your family is still back here. So how, how would you characterize the, the uh, tempestuousness of the debate where you are versus where we are up here? Well, it gets pretty acrimonious even up here. So on social media, I get attacked every single day, often multiple times a day. And well, about 50% of that comes from people in the US. There's a hefty share from Alberta, Saskatchewan, and even Ontario. So I know that these issues are contentious right here at home too. But we just had a federal election. Every major political party had a climate plan. It was legitimate, it set, they set goals, they had ways to achieve those goals, and that puts us ahead of where the United States is, where there are still politicians today who refuse to acknowledge that this thing is real. But of course, a wildfire does not knock on your door and ask you who you just voted for before it burns down your house. In the same way, we need climate action across the spectrum. Well, since you just raised it, I, I'm gonna read one line out of your book here, because you get called all these things. Communist, libtard, lunatic, Jezebel, liar, whore, 
high priestess of the climate cult and handmaiden of the Antichrist. How do you get up every day and, and read these things about you and not just want to crawl under the covers and go back to bed? Well, at first I absolutely did because here I was coming at completely naively thinking, surely if people just know the facts, it will change their minds, right? And the answer, of course, is no. It isn't about facts and data. It's about connecting to what's in our hearts. So what I realized is, you know what? In a way, when you get attacked, it's almost a little bit of an inverse compliment because they feel like you are actually posing a threat, not to their facts, but to their ideology, to their identity, to what they hold dear. But the reality is, you know, all of us want a better future. All of us want a safe place to live. We all want to breathe in air that's not choked with wildfire smoke, as we even saw in Ontario this summer. We don't want our homes to be flooded. We want a safe economy. We want a secure world. And when we start the conversation in those places from the heart rather than from the head, we can often come to surprising agreement with all but what I call in the book the seven percenters, everybody but them. We're going to get to them in a second. But on this issue of whether facts are enough to persuade people, let me pull an excerpt from the book here. Because you write, it's important to understand what's happening to our world and how it affects us. But bombarding someone with more data, facts, and science only engages their defenses, pushes them into self-justification, and leaves us more divided than when we began. And I, you know, based on my own experience, I'd say you're 100% right about that. But how do you begin to persuade people of that which you want to persuade them if you don't intend to introduce empirically provable facts to help make your case? Well, Steve, that was a hard one for me as a scientist to swallow because I spent many years trying to do exactly that. But what I've discovered is if we are able to start from the heart rather than the head, if we're able to connect over something that we share, something we have in common. In, in my book, I talk about Renee, who's a student from Ottawa, who's a ski racer. So she begins by talking to her fellow winter sports advocates about snow. I'm a mom, so I often talk to people about our kids' health. Obviously, I'm also a person of faith, so I tend to uh, begin conversations with faith-based values if people share those. I like talking about what's happening right here where I live in Texas, what's happening right in Toronto, where I'm from. Beginning a conversation with something that matters to us, connecting the dots to how climate change is affecting it, but don't stop there always, always bring up a positive, constructive solution that you might be doing yourself, that your city is part of, that a business is part of, that an organization is part of, to show, you know what? This climate action thing is not a giant boulder sitting at the bottom of an impossibly steep hill with only people like, you know, David Suzuki and Elizabeth May trying to push it up the hill. <laughs> that boulder is already at the top of the hill. It's already rolling down the hill in the right direction. And there are literally millions of hands on that boulder. We just need more. Won't you add yours? That's a very different picture. No. OK, I take your point on that. But then let me pursue um, let me pursue this from a faith angle. Because you are, you're very open about the fact that you're a practicing Christian and that informs so much of your professional and personal life. But then you do run into fellow Christians who say, look, this is all in God's hands and it doesn't matter what we do. You know, he'll take care of everything. Uh, that doesn't sound like somebody who's read the passage of the Bible that talks about reaping what you're sowing. So how do you deal with that? So often when people want to reject the reality of climate change, we can't bring ourselves to say, sure, it's real, and it affects the poorest and most vulnerable people, from people living on the streets in Toronto or Halifax and Vancouver to people in Southeast Asia whose rice fields are being flooded by sea level. We don't want to say, sure, it's real, but I don't want to fix it. So instead, we come up with science sounding objections, like, oh, it's just volcanoes or a natural cycle, or we come up with religious-y sounding objections. <laughs> oh, God is in control or the world's gonna end anyway, so why does it matter? To answer the science-y sounding objections, as I talk about in the book, we can give short science-y answers, but pivot immediately to why it matters and what we can do to fix it. To answer the religious-y sounding objections, we need to give short theological answers and then pivot immediately to why it matters and what we can do to fix it. So the answer to that is, read the Bible. In Genesis 1, it says God gave humans responsibility over every living thing on this earth. And there was an amazing piece of good news just this morning I want to share with you, Steve. Mm. I just heard that the Presbyterian Church in Ireland voted to divest from fossil fuels. And in the speech to the General Assembly before the vote, they quoted from saving us. And they said, because climate change affects the most poorest and most vulnerable people in the world, how can we as people of faith continue to support the system. Does that sound like progress to you? 
Absolutely. Okay, let me circle back now because you did talk about the 7% who are, well, let me put the whole list up here. Sheldon, you wanna do this? This is board two, middle of page three. The attitudes that you've seen to climate change, and you talk about them in your book, the six Americas, you call them, the alarmed, who make up 26%, the concerned, 28%, the cautious, 20%, the disengaged, 7%, the doubtful, 11%, and the dismissive, 7%. As you look at that list, what ought we to be the most concerned about? Which chunk of the population? The majority of us are alarmed, concerned, but we never talk about this issue and we're not activated because we don't know what to do about it. So that's who I wrote this book for, for everyone who's worried about this issue, which in the States is already 70%, according to the latest poll just last week. And in Canada, I would venture to say we're higher than 70% too. But we don't know what to do because here's this global problem that threatens civilization as we know it. That's what's at stake. And we're told to change our light bulbs, recycle and eat less meat. And we know instinctively that's not going to fix a global problem. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, LED light bulbs, eating less meat and recycling are all good things to do. And I do them and we should all do them. But the reality is the world has to change. And here's the crazy thing. When you start to look back at the way the world has changed in the past, and it has, the world has changed significantly. We used to have an economy in the UK and in the United States that was primarily based on owning other people and profiting off their labor. We used to, as women, not be able to vote. There used to be situations in the United States, in South Africa, even more recently, where the color of your skin determined whether you were eligible to hold a job or enter a certain building. The world has changed dramatically. And when it did, it wasn't because a prime minister decided it had to, or a CEO, or a king, or a president. It was when ordinary people decided the world could and should be different. And they did everything they could in their personal lives, but they did one more important thing, which is what all of our children are doing today. They raised their voices to say, we need change. No, fair enough, but all the examples you just gave took hundreds of years to take place, and we don't have that kind of time now. So uh, how do we light, you know, light a bit of a fire under all of us to, to, to make sure it doesn't take, as you suggest, 300 years to get rid of slavery, et cetera? Absolutely. We have to do this as soon as possible because that's what the science says. The more we cut our carbon emissions, the faster we do it, the better off we're going to be. And so that's why the first thing in the to knock over the first domino of that change is to start talking about something that we are not talking about, but not dumping tons of scientific facts on people, but rather this, using our voice to advocate for change. Each of us sits at different tables. We sit at our kitchen table, sure, but we also sit at, you know, we're, we're part of the place we work, the school, our children's school, a neighborhood, a city, a riding, a province, um, a social organization, a place of worship. We are all part of larger spheres of influence. And we need to use our voice to say, what could our business be doing? Look at them over there. They're doing this. What could we do? What could our university be doing more of? That university did this. Why aren't we doing it too? using our voice to get that boulder rolling faster down the hill to get more hands on that boulder, get it going as fast as possible because the better off we'll all be. Okay, Catherine, but then here's where I come back in and say, here's the political reality that you're trying to deal with. And I love the story in the book. <laughs> well, here, I'll just do it very briefly here. Farmer saying to you, I would like to agree with you, but if I agree with you, it means I have to agree with Al Gore and I could never do that. Now, how do you get around that conundrum? We need not just Al Gore, we need Republican politicians to say this thing is real. And here's the amazing thing. There is a bipartisan climate solutions caucus in the House and the Senate in the United States that is made up of Republican and Democrat representatives and senators because you can only join if you join with somebody from the opposite party. We need more and more of those. And how do you get more of those? You get their supporters, not just people who live in their district, but the people and the organizations who donate to their, their causes to say, look, we need climate solutions. And how do that, does that happen when people inside those organizations use their voices to say, we need to stand for not just what's right, but what's best for all of us. So truly in a democratic society, we all have a role to play, every single one of us to get this boulder going as fast as possible. I hear you, but the, but the people who tend to take up the preponderance of the time on American cable television and therefore have the greatest opportunities to uh, influence hearts and minds 
are, are not those people. They are the people who've got an, a, a great investment in keeping the food fight alive. And if a conservative sees a liberal Democrat believing in something, they are automatically going to be against it. So again, how, how do you change that paradigm? Because without changing that paradigm, I'm not sure how you make progress. Well, for-profit media is sadly part of the problem because they go entirely on clicks. And when you see people agreeing with each other, that's not nearly as interesting as the food fight, so to speak, as you say, mm -hmm. of people yelling over each other and disagreeing with each other. And so when we look at how polarized this issue is, it has also become more polarized because it's constantly represented as an issue that people are arguing over instead of an issue that affects every single one of us, no matter where we live. And so I believe that those of us in the media, as you are doing yourself right now, Steve, have a greater responsibility to show that this issue affects every single one of us right here, right now. And there are solutions in every part of our country, from Alberta to Newfoundland, that make sense for all of us. All right. I love the metaphor of all of our hands need to be on that boulder to help roll it down the hill. But let's put some let's put some actual flesh on that bone. What do you want people to do? I want people, whoever they are, wherever they are, to be using their voices to advocate for climate action, to help spur that action, whatever sphere they're in, whatever responsibility they have. And believe me, if grade school children can do it, all of us can do it wherever we are because we need every hand on that boulder. We don't only need the prime ministers or the green parties or David Suzuki's, like I said. We don't only need people like Protect Our Winters who care about winter snow or organizations like Iron Plus Earth that are helping um, people in the oil and gas industry retrain to do clean energy installations. We need everybody's hand on that boulder. Why? Because to be someone who cares about climate change, you only have to be one thing a human living on planet Earth, and we are all that. I would love you to tell the story, uh, which is in the book, about the Rotary Club. The Rotarians are some of the most salt-of-the-earth people I've ever met. And, and, and you went to a meeting, and they were inclined from the get-go to oppose you on this until you demonstrated for them how their values and your values actually lined up. Share that story if you would. Yes. So here in West Texas, I was invited to speak at our local Rotary Club some time ago. And I already knew that I needed to begin with something we agreed on. So if I'm talking to a local group, typically I would, I would start with talking about how here in Lubbock, we actually won a national competition for the wildest weather of any city in the country and how we've all experienced this crazy weather, but how if we look at what's happening, we see that our weather is getting weirder. Our hurricanes are getting stronger. Heavy rainfall is getting more frequent. Summer heat is getting more extreme. So I was going to begin with sort of a place-based perspective that we could all share. But I walked in, and if you're a Rotarian, you'll laugh because I didn't know this, walking in, not being a Rotarian. I walked in, and there was this giant four-foot banner with the four-way test on it, which is the four questions that Rotarians ask when they're going to make a decision. Mm -hmm. Is it the truth? Is it fair? Is it beneficial to all concerned? And I looked at this banner. I thought to myself, that's climate change. Is it true? Yes, we really have checked for over 150 years. It is true. Is it fair? Absolutely not. In fact, that's why I am a climate scientist because it disproportionately affects the poorest and most marginalized people who have done the least to contribute to the problem. It is not fair. Would solutions be beneficial? For sure. Fossil fuel air pollution, just the air pollution, not the heat trapping gases. Fossil fuel air pollution is responsible for nearly 9 million premature deaths per year and over 2 million premature births per year as well. Just put that in perspective with COVID. We're just over 4.5 million premature deaths from COVID around the world. And Every premature death is a tragedy, but double that every year from air pollution, of course it would be beneficial to address that issue, leaving aside climate change alone. So I, I skipped the chicken buffet. I sat in the corner, you know, perched on a seat and reworked my whole presentation into the four-way test. And then I started the presentation and I could see there was a lot of sort of this body language, <laughs> you know, and there was a bit of side eye at the woman who invited me, like, we know what you did <laughs> and you're not going to do this again. <laughs> But as I started to go through the four-way test, I could see the arms were unfolding and people were starting to lean forward and the heads started to nod. And at the end, I'll never forget, a local banker came forward who I had met before a few times and he'd always been courteous but distant. He came forward with the most bemused look on his face I'd ever seen. He said, 
I never thought too much of this whole global warming thing, which is the polite Texan way of saying I thought it was a load of crap, but it passed the four-way test. What can I do? He had to sign on. It passed the four-way test. That's the power of starting with your heart and connecting over shared values. Whoever we are, we already have every reason to care. It doesn't matter who we voted for in the last election. It doesn't matter where we come from, where we live, what we do. Every single one of us already has every reason we need to care. And if we don't think we care, it's because we haven't connected the dots between the fact that we would do anything for our child, or we love the place where we live, or we have somewhere in Canada that we love that we want to be the same for our kids to show them when they grew up, or we just want snow on the ground, or we don't want invasive species coming into our yard, or whatever it is whether we're worried about getting Lyme disease that's spreading north of the border, whether we're worried about thawing permafrost up in the north, whether we're worried about flooding and extreme heat in our cities today, every single one of us has a reason to care. That's Catherine Hayhoe, whose latest contribution to this discussion is Saving Us, a climate scientist case for hope and healing in a divided world, and we're always delighted, whatever the reason, uh, to get her onto TVO and talk about these issues as she does so eloquently. Catherine, you be well, and thanks again for joining us on TVO tonight. Thank you so much, Steve. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, October 6th, 2021. Ontario is not alone in facing a housing shortage. Tomorrow, why? It's an international problem. Also, what's made food and fuel prices rise? We'll get some insight on that. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The Agenda is always on. To catch up on conversations from this week or any week, visit our website, tvo.org slash the agenda, or our YouTube page at youtube.com slash the agenda. It's all there for whenever you want to watch.